This video explains how storefront systems work. We've created a drawing, a three-dimensional drawing of a storefront window, and we're able to cut through walls and see the insides of the parts that make up the storefront window. We want to take a look at the different components of the window and how they're arranged. This will be a side view. You can see the head intermediate and the sill. Sill is very important. We'll pan around to kind of give us a little bit of perspective on what we're looking at. So this is a 2D representation. Now, if we remove the jam and all of those associated parts, our 2D representation will be a little bit more clean. The storefront frame sits in the subsill. Note that the terms subsill, sill pan, sill flashing, these are intended to represent the same thing. Different manufacturers in the industry use these terms differently and generally they're considered to be interchangeable. The subsill is cut to size and then an end dam is put on it. The pink area indicates where we want to have caulking. The end dam is going to be attached to the subsill with fastener. The end dam is the most critical seal in the entire storefront system. And it's worth pointing out some of the details that affect its long-term performance. Using our x-ray vision, we can see the sealant applied to the top of the end dam where it meets the underside of the sill flashing. Before the frame is installed, caulking will be applied to the upper surfaces of the joint between the sill flashing and the end dam. It's important to understand that we're not actually creating a caulk joint here. What we're doing is we're creating a gasket. We're creating a gasket using sealant material and that gasket is going to be between the sill flashing and the end dam. And it's different than a caulk joint. To clarify that point, let's look at what a caulk joint is. A caulk joint is going to join two different materials to each other. It's going to create a watertight seal between those materials and it's going to allow them to move relative to each other. That movement is important because we have thermal expansion and contraction. We also have wind forces that push on the window and the building and all of these different building components are moving. Maybe not all together. And what happens is the caulking needs to be able to stretch. As those different things move, the caulking stretches. And the caulking can only stretch a percentage of its length. There's not a lot of length between the sill flashing and the end dam, so we call it a gasket. It's not a caulk joint, it's a gasket. We don't want to leave space in between the sill flashing and the end dam. What we want to do is we want to create another gasket along the side of the sill flashing and where it meets the end dam. So we'll have a gasket on the bottom and a gasket along the side. This is a best practice based on the idea that if the sealant we've applied to the upper surfaces, if that sealant separates and allows water to go in behind it, then we have a gasket below that seal and this is not something that we have if we don't unite the caulking applied to the underside with the caulking that's applied to the upper side. The subsill is placed in the opening usually but not always we'll put a screw on either end of it to locate it and hold it in the position where we want it to be. Reference the installation instructions for the correct procedure. Uh, this is how we would fasten the sill pan in place. We would use a screw at the end and shim the screw up. Now we're going to caulk the end dam. We're going to seal up the screws um, so that no water can leak through. Now this uh, caulking of the end dam, it's very important that we create a seal here in the front. And the reason for this is because when we put a frame in, it's possible that our exterior caulk joint won't 
tie into the indam and create a seal there. If the indam isn't sealed to the wall, then water could kind of leak around the indam. Our exterior caulk joint, that's going to seal the frame. It's not going to seal the indam. So we want to make sure to put this caulking in here at the indam. The other important thing is we want to we want to get ourselves in a good position so that when we apply the exterior caulk joint, which is in this yellow area here, we want that caulking to create a seal right below this subsill. Okay, it's not going to go above. It's going to go right underneath, and where the end dam ends we want caulking to kind of be in front of that so that we can pick up the caulking with our exterior um, perimeter seal ideally the exterior perimeter seal is going to tie into all of this caulking and you can see the end dam stops a little bit short of our exterior perimeter seal along the bottom so it's important when we install the subsill with the end dam, place it in the opening, it's important that we pay attention and seal it in such a way that our exterior perimeter seal is able to tie into the sealant that we provide for the flashing. The sill flashing is a very important part of the storefront system, but it's not the only part. We also have other extruded aluminum components, glass, and rubber. Aluminum extrusion has some tolerances that we need to be aware of. You start by taking a hot billet of aluminum, it's the cylindrical shape, and then you press it through a die. The die shape has the shape of the profile. It squirts out of the die quite hot in a fairly plastic state. It's grabbed by a machine that trims the extruded parts. They go down a conveyor where they get stretched. And this is why aluminum profiles are so straight. Machines will clamp on either end of the profiles and then stretch the material about 3%. And it's that stretching that straightens the aluminum material. It's like pulling a string. After they're stretched, then the ends are trimmed. You can see the ends, they're not straight. That's where the machine grabs it to clamp it. And there you go. You have a perfect uh, aluminum profile after that. But perfect is within tolerance. And the tolerance is one degree in the angle where sides meet. There can be other specifications for a particular shape, but in general, aluminum profiles are going to have a one degree tolerance for the angles of meeting surfaces. This is why we use rubber gaskets when we install glass in aluminum frames. The rubber gasket is what takes up the space between the glass and the metal. And again, we don't know the thickness of the glass, and we don't know exactly the thickness or the relative geometric positions of the aluminum extrusion member itself. So that's why we use rubber. Rubber is not a, a water seal. It's a means of taking up the space between the glass and the metal when we don't know exactly what that space is going to be. The thickness of glass is uncertain as well. We have a tolerance in quarter inch thick glass from 0.219 inches to 0.244 inches. AGC published a handbook where they declare tolerances for various different types of glass, including insulating units. Insulated units composed of two pieces of glass and an airspace require a one millimeter tolerance. It's almost a sixteenth of an inch. What this means is that we don't know the size of the glass pocket. We don't know the size of the glass and we need some kind of a material such as rubber to take up the space 
between the different sizes of metal and the different sizes of glass so that we can create a window system that doesn't have glass rattling around in it. The sill is very important, but in order to understand how a storefront system works, we need to think about the whole system, including the intermediate horizontals. As we just discussed, the rubber takes up the space between the glass and the frame. It's not a waterproofing element. Here we remove the glass stop so we can see inside of the storefront frame. So water hits the glass, it goes down the glass to where it meets the rubber, and then it goes inside of the storefront frame because the rubber is not a water seal. When water goes into the system at an intermediate horizontal, it can pull up on the horizontal where it would flow to either end. Now I've added a water diverter into the drawing. Viewing from the top, you can see that the water diverter extends beyond the horizontal into the space occupied by the glass pocket. It hangs right off of the end of the intermediate horizontal and it ends almost at the back of the glass pocket. And you can see how it slopes downward. As water pools up on the intermediate horizontal, it follows the water diverter down and into the back of the glass pocket. Basically, the vertical mullions of a storefront system like this are acting like downspouts, like gutters have downspouts. Gutters go around the edge of your house and they connect to downspouts. The water goes from the gutter into the downspout and then it goes down. Gravity pulls the water down. In order to control the water, we want to send it as far back into the glass pocket as we can. If we can get it into the back of the glass pocket and it goes straight down, it's going to go into the sill pan. Now, just so everyone's on the same page, these are excerpts from installation instructions for a storefront, and they describe the water diverter. Now, why in the world would a storefront system have a part called a water diverter if it wasn't intended to divert water inside of the system? Now we have the sill. We know that the storefront is designed to put water down into the sill and we understand that the sill fills up with water. But water doesn't go inside, it drains to the outside. And this doesn't happen by magic. It happens because there's no seal in between the sill and the sill flashing. There isn't a seal here because water goes into the storefront and it needs to be able to come out. We can't create a seal between the sill and the sill flashing or we won't be able to get water out of the system. We also can't put brake metal or anything else on top of the sill where it drains at the sill pan. Anything in front of the window that's above the sill flashing will cause the system not to drain. If the system can't drain, that'll be fine for a while because all of the penetrations in the sill flashing will be caulked. All the screws, the holes, the end dams, everything in the sill flashing is going to be sealed up tight. And it won't leak, at least for a little while. But when you leave caulking submerged in water, eventually it's going to leak. And if water can't drain to the exterior, then when it leaks, it's going to leak to the interior. And that's not what we want. We want the water to go outside. But that's not the whole story. 
When the wind blows, it exerts a pressure on the storefront. The wind pushes on the glass, the metal. It exerts a pressure, and that pressure can oppose water from draining. If it's raining and the wind is blowing, then we can have a condition where the sill fills up with water. As the amount of water increases, so does the water pressure at the surface of the sill. You might be wondering, is there a way to convert wind pressure into the equivalent water pressure? Of course there is. It's just not very interesting. What is interesting is that the taller the back leg is, the more water the system can hold, and so the higher water rating the system can have. This explains why the bottom tracks on sliding glass doors have gotten to be three and a half inches tall. They can hold more water. They get a higher water rating. It's not that people like to trip over them. If we take a look at installation instructions for Coral FL300, a lot of people don't realize when they're reading the instructions for how to assemble the frame panels, where it's showing that the ends of the horizontal elements receive a sealant where they meet with the verticals. They don't realize what's actually happening here is that we're creating a water barrier at the sill. When the frames are properly built, we don't expect water to come up from in between the sill and the vertical. Continuing to read the instructions, we see that when we place the sill flashing in the opening, we're supposed to caulk along the end dam and then horizontally along the entire length of the sill flashing. You can see the intention is for the sealant between the sill and the vertical to tie into this horizontal silicone along the flashing. And that's great because if we don't want water coming in here, then we also don't want it coming in between the sill and the sill flashing. The only problem with that is when you install the frame panel, caulking squirts out the top. Your helper cleans it up, and before you know it, he's made a hell of a mess. A simple solution is to pick up that caulk joint a little lower. This is a critical seal. We need to bring the sealant down so that it meets the level of the horizontal sealant that we apply to the sill flashing. It's a critical seal.